Welcome. Thank you for joining me. Gray Board Gamer here with a solo playthrough of Hornet Leader Carrier Air Operations by Dan Viersen Games. And I apologize if I said his name incorrectly. Before we get started, I just want to talk about the amazing customer service at Dan Viersen Games. We have several of Dan Viersen's games in our board game cafe. Recently, I had a customer spill a drink on the main board for our copy of Warfighter Modern. I contacted Dan Viersen Games through the link on their website and asked if it was possible to buy just a replacement board for that game and the cost for the board and shipping. They responded the very next day, asked me for my address and said they'd be sending me the board for free, which was a big surprise, kind of, seeing that the quality of their games and how much I enjoy playing them, it doesn't surprise me that they also have excellent customer service, but it was a, a very nice gesture on their part. And when I received that new board in the mail, they also included three expansions for that particular game in with the board. They didn't tell me they were doing that. They just showed up in there, again, at no charge. Unbelievable customer service. With that being said, let me walk you through the setup and get to playing Hornet Leader Carrier Air Operations. You can see I have several items laid out here. We have the main tactical display, which is where most of the action will occur. I have the target and event cards. They have spaces marked for them, but I just went ahead and put my deck holders right there. There's a turn marker up here. This is the campaign we'll be doing, the Syria 2004 campaign. I have my player log down here on the left, the instruction booklet, my cup of enemies ready to go, my counters for my ordnance. I have my plane chits right here. Also, this stack of cards you see over here are the uh, advancement cards for my pilots. If any of them get promoted, that's the, the new cards that they'll receive. I also have a couple of player aids that I use. I'll flash those up on the screen. Also in the description below will be the link to these particular player aids. They come in really handy when you're doing your phase where you're arming your aircraft. You can quickly look at which weapons can go on which type of aircraft. And the other one shows you the special rules for each weapon right in front of you. This player aid here, like the little clipboard, the uh, help sheet that comes with the game. And what I will do during the playthrough is explain things as we go. Whenever something comes up that we haven't seen before, whether it's a type of aircraft, a weapon, etc., I will put that up on the screen so you don't have to worry if I'm holding things down here and or off to the side and talking about them. I'm going to be putting them up on the screen so you'll be able to see everything much easier and I'll be able to highlight things a lot easier than bringing them up to the camera and pointing at things. We're going to be doing a campaign. We'll be doing the short campaign on the Syria sheet here. The game also comes with several additional campaigns that you can do short, medium, or long campaigns on. They also have downloadable campaigns on the Dan Viersen Games website. And I think there are some fan-made ones also on BGG. If we look at the Syria 2004 campaign sheet, our overview, and it shows this is a standard difficulty game. Extremists seize control of the Syrian government and begin enriching uranium at key industrial sites. To the south, Syrian forces cross the Israeli border. Here in the notes, it says to draw targets 2, 47, and 56 before the start of the campaign. They, being those targets, begin the campaign in play. And it shows you the different types of campaign, short, medium, or long, depending on which one you want to play. Usually I do a long campaign if I'm playing solo because I like to go through a lot of missions and see my pilots progress throughout the different days. But for purposes of brevity and gameplay, just really showing you how the game works and seeing if it's something that you're interested in, I'll be doing this short campaign, which is going to be done over four days. And I will start initially with 24 special option points. 
we can see here the victory point evaluation. At the end of those four days, depending on how many victory points I've been able to amass, it'll tell me what my evaluation is. You'll also see notes for standard weapons and special weapons. Standard weapons are what I can place on my aircraft, as long as those aircraft can hold those types of weapons, which we'll get more into later. Special weapons do cost me special option points, and we'll talk about that the first time it occurs. And there's an additional note that says the first four special option points of special weapons armed each day, and day being a very specific word, and you'll see that if we have any secondary missions on a day. They don't cost me any special option points, the first four. And then the second note is 12 special option points for JDAMs, and those are a specific type of weapon that can go after fixed targets. They are quite costly, especially on a short campaign where I only have 24 to start with, but they are extremely effective at taking out fixed targets. I don't know if I'll get to use any of them, but we will talk about them if I don't. And I'll go over Recon, Intel, and Infra, which stands for Infrastructure, later on in gameplay. We've decided to do a campaign. First, you'll place the tactical display somewhere close to you that's easy to reach all parts of it because this is where the majority of your action will take place. Next, you're going to decide if you want to do a U.S. Navy or Marine Corps campaign. If we look here in my player log, you circle which one you want to do. I've chosen to do the U.S. Navy campaign because I want to show you different types of aircraft. If you do the Marine Corps campaign, I believe it's just two types of aircraft, uh, Harriers and one other that you're going to be using. I haven't done a Marine Corps campaign yet. You'll circle the length, like I said, short, and it'll tell you on that particular campaign's card how many days there are. And my initial points are actually 30. And the reason for that is why they're not 24. There's an optional rule during setup that allows you to do random squadron selection, which means you don't get to pick the types of aircraft that are going to be in your squadron. The way I do that is I have a cup just like this full of all the pilots' chits, and there are several pilots in the game. And when I draw it, I make sure that it is a type of aircraft that exists during this time period, and it's for the proper campaign, whether it's U.S. Navy or Marine Corps. For the U.S. Navy one, I cannot take any Harrier jets, so I always just put those to the side when I draw them. If I draw it and the plane fits into operational status during, in this case, the year 2004, it goes into my squadron. If we look at the starting aircraft on the help sheet, it'll show you how many aircraft of what particular skill level you get. In this case, a short campaign, I'm going to get one newbie, two green, four average, and one skilled pilot. Next step up would be Veteran, and beyond that is Ace. Now, I drew these in order, so the first eligible one that I drew was my newbie. Next eligible one I drew was one of the green, then the next one was the second green, and so on, until I had a squadron of eight planes. And because I did random selection and did not choose my planes, for a short campaign, you get six additional special option points. And that's why I started with 30. You'll also see that it'll say aircraft special option point adjustment, and I have a negative four there. What that means is as you assign aircraft to your squadron, you look, and I'll show you on Caveman's card here, on the left side, it'll show you the years that the plane began and or ended operation. In this case, we're in the year 2000 for the FA-18 Echo Hornet. And since we're in 2004, that plane fits the parameter. And you'll see in brackets there, it says negative 2, negative 4, negative 6. Those numbers are for short, medium, and long campaigns. For every FA-18 Echo Hornet that I bring into my squadron, I lose two special option points for a short campaign. And I have two of those. One is Caveman, and the other is Shepard one of our average pilots. Those are the only two aircraft that add or subtract special option points for my squadron during this campaign playthrough. There are some older aircraft that can't do as much as far as carry 
as many weapons, are as maneuverable, and those you actually get to add points on to your special option points at the beginning. We don't have any of those in this squadron. And to quickly show you who is in my squadron, we'll go in order of uh, skill level. We have Caveman and an FA-18 Echo Hornet. Eyes in our Echo 2 Charlie Hawkeye. Lightning in an FA-18 Charlie Hornet. And there is Shepard in our Echo. Blackhawk, also in a Charlie. Griffin, another Charlie. Duke, another FA-18 Charlie. And finally, our skilled pilot, Farm Boy, who's in an F-14 Tomcat. And he barely made the cut because it shows there on the side that those aircraft were operational from 1972 to 2006. And for options and things that happened during the campaign, there's a spot for notes. And right there, I put random squadron selection, gave me six additional special option points. Now that I've selected my squadron, either by choice or by random drawing, you have the option to do special pilot promotion priority, which depending on campaign length will cost you uh, 6, 12, or 18, I believe, special operations points for each pilot you want to promote before you start. Special options points, I think I might have said special operations points, special options points are very hard to come by. So you have to be very judicious with how you use them. So right now, I started with 30, and I've already spent four just because of the aircraft I have. So I'm already down to 26 for a four-day campaign. For every pilot I want to promote to the next skill level, it will cost me six of those points to promote them to the next skill level. You can do this multiple times to one pilot. You can do it to a bunch of different pilots, but every single promotion costs you six. And with 26 to spend for this entire campaign and the ability to earn more is very low during the campaign. You have to think really hard if you want to promote somebody early. It has to give you a pretty good advantage. Because if I spend six right now for just one pilot, I'm down to 20 already for the rest of the campaign, which is tight. And you'll see why as we get into gameplay how these points are spent. So I'm going to look over my squadron real quick and see if there's somebody that's worth spending those six points to bring them to the next level, if it's going to make a big impact as we start here. After looking through my pilots, I did decide to promote one because it's going to make a big difference right away. So we have the pilot Eyes, who's one of our green pilots in the Echo 2 Charlie Hawkeye. This plane does not attack during missions, but it does a lot of work when it's part of the mission you're going on. So we'll look over the card differences real quick to see why I chose this. The main reason I chose it, I'll put the green and the average card both on screen so you can see there's not a whole lot of change in the stats. But in that yellow print saying that you can ignore events on a 7 plus, that didn't change, but that's also very useful. Can give situational awareness, that's also very useful and we'll get into that when we start flying campaigns. The main thing was that next one that gets added on. Get a plus one on all your ATA rolls. That's air-to-air -air attack rolls. And that applies to every pilot that's on that mission. So just by upgrading this one, it's going to give me a plus one to everybody that's on a mission that Eyes is on as an average pilot. So it's definitely worth it to promote them and spend those six points. I'm done spending special option points, and for ease of saying it, I'm just going to call them SO points from here forward. I placed the recon intel and infra chits in their starting positions, and the way those work, I did not scan these, so I do have to hold it up for you. You can see it has arrows pointing to the right. Where they start, you always look to the right, even as they progress. That's what those arrows are pointing at. We start with our recon of three intel of plus one center sight. We're going to want to change that quickly because that's a bonus for the enemy. And infrastructure of minus zero hits right now. And I'll explain how these work during the course of gameplay. We're set up and ready to go. The sequence of gameplay is printed right here 
on the tactical display so it's easy to follow along once you know the flow of the game and you know the rules. Speaking of the rules, as I was reading over the FAQs and everything to prepare for this, I noticed I was doing a few things wrong. I'm going to do my best to make as few mistakes as possible. But if you see any, please comment and let me know so I can make notes of those and not make those errors in any future playthroughs I may do. And again, as something comes up for the first time, whether it is an aircraft or a weapon, I'll do a quick explanation of that item, show you a picture of the real world thing. Uh, I looked for a lot of pictures, tried to find the best ones that I could for each thing, tried to find the correct ones. So if any of those are incorrect also, please let me know. In the notes down below, there are links to credit every site and location that I got any of those pictures from, along with the links to the special sheets made by other players on BGG that I use to aid in the gameplay. The first thing we see on the pre-flight is to draw the target cards. Right here, these are the targets. At the beginning of the setup, I didn't do this on camera, if we look on the Syria campaign sheet in this green target area, you see all these numbers. Target cards are all numbered individually. That tells me which targets are in play during this campaign. So I have all of those cards in this target deck. I shuffled them up to make our draw deck for this game. If it ever gets depleted, again, you would shuffle them and make a new draw pile. Same with the event cards. The event cards are the entire event deck. They are the same for every campaign, but there's three sections on each card, so the variability is a lot more than just that one deck of cards, and you'll see as we go through it. So we're going to draw our target cards first. That's where recon comes into play. Right now my recon is three, which means I can draw up to three target cards. And there are reasons to stop drawing two. So we'll look at our first target and it will be target 49, the laboratory. And if we look on the Syria map, we'll see target 49 is in the second column there. That white arrow on the left just shows you the avenue of approach where you're coming from. It has no bearing on gameplay. It just gives you an idea of where you're coming from when your planes are flying in. And 49 is in that second band or second column. And we see down below it says WP minus one. Those are weight points. And when I arm the aircraft, I'll show you what those are. Weight points are essentially how much ordnance you can put on your planes, missiles, bombs, rockets, etc. Flying that distance means we're going to use a little extra fuel. So whatever weight rating my plane is, it's going to be minus one. I can carry one less. There is a way to overcome that. And there's an th option called tanker priority that you can spend special options, I'm sorry, SO points on. And the way that works is, depending on how many planes are going, so say we were taking three aircraft, for every aircraft on the mission, in this theoretical instance three, you take one SO point off. So it would be three to give you what's called tanker priority, which means you get to ignore that weight point penalty. Now in the first band here, or I'm sorry, the second band, we're only losing one, so it's not as critical. I wouldn't want to spend my SO points this early just to negate a one. If we have targets way off in band four, five, that's much more drastic, and having the extra weight really helps there. So we'll look at the card here. You'll see that there's kind of a greenish tint to the a picture of the laboratory. That means if we want to use the special option of night missions, which I do during my campaigns, we would attack this target at night. And there's different ways that the turn sequence goes when you're at night. Here on the left, it tells you what is there. We have weapon sites and then bandits, which are enemy aircraft, and how many hits it takes to actually destroy the laboratory. All this will be explained further on. On the right, we have victory points if you destroy it, and the bonuses you get to your sliding 
numbers down at the bottom of the campaign sheet. In this case, it would bump our Intel up two, which would be great because it would get rid of that, get rid of that uh, plus one center site. In the middle, you see the yellow four. That's how many aircraft you are allowed to take on that mission, up to four. You can take less if you want to. Down below, we have keywords, secondary. Secondary means I could choose this target to attack on the same day after I attack my primary target. If you have nothing that says secondary that you draw, then you're only going to attack one primary target that day. I like to try to attack secondary targets because then you will get more victory points in one day because you'll go on two missions and get you closer to that higher rating on your campaign evaluation. If you draw two secondaries, a secondary can be a primary. So if I draw another secondary, I could choose one of those as my primary mission and use the secondary as a secondary mission. If it doesn't say secondary on it, then it would always be the primary target. We see stress plus two. That means that every pilot that flies on this mission will gain two additional stress at the end on the way home. Fixed is a type of uh, target. These are buildings. They're a fixed target, which means that JDAMs could target them. But again, I don't have enough special target points, not special target, SO points to do that, really. I only have 20 left. And then we have the bonus. If we destroy the target, every pilot gains plus one experience. Every pilot that's flown on that mission and experience is difficult to come by. If you can gain extra experience early on, which brings your pilots for promotion quicker, that's great. But 12 hits is a lot. So right now we'll keep drawing. We can draw up to two more for a total of three. And here, just like I said, we have a second secondary target. This is target 15, the cement factory. And if we look on our map of Syria, the cement factory is way out there in the very final band, which means we would lose four of our weight points on every plane and suffer three additional stress on the way home after the mission is done. But attacking a target way out there will give you an additional experience for that mission. The cement factory takes seven hits to destroy. It's worth two victory points and two on our infrastructure. It's also a secondary target. It's also a fixed target. And then we see overkill. It only takes seven to destroy it, but if we inflict 10 or more damage to the cement factory, we would gain an additional experience. So if we were to go way out there and attack that, we're going to get an additional experience just for going that far and an additional if we can inflict 10 or more hits on it. So I might decide to go after that target as a primary and I might skip a secondary target this time because I'm going to have to put a lot of resources into that. But what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and draw our third. And that is amazing. All three cards are night targets. That's going to really mix things up here. So here we have Central Command. Target number 47, which is also in that second band. This is a fixed target. It does have an improvement though. When an improvement comes up, it stays in play until it's destroyed. And you can see it says move any one campaign counter one to the left at the end of each day. So that means as long as this target remains in play, any of these counters are going to move one backwards. I get to choose which one if there's multiple options, but it's hard enough to do things and destroy targets and get these moving to the right. We don't want them to go backwards. This is not a secondary target, which means I would have to choose this as a primary, and then I could do one of these as a secondary. You can see Central Command is quite difficult. There are a lot of enemy aircraft, a ton of them, under bandits. Five is a lot in the center area. It takes nine hits, but we can take six aircraft on that mission. But if I do that, and you do a secondary mission, every pilot that went on the primary cannot go on the secondary. 
Every pilot can only fly one mission per day, and a primary and secondary mission take place in the same day. So if I sent six, that would leave me only two aircraft to go after the cement factory or laboratory. I've decided to take the central command target because it's closer, so I won't have to use any points for the weight loss since I'm only losing one. Plus, I can take six aircraft with me. I can also take my um, recon plane eyes. I can take that aircraft with me at no additional penalty. It does not count towards the six. So I could actually send seven aircraft out on this mission, which I'm going to need them with that many bandits in the sky. Plus, this is a night mission, which makes it a little more difficult because of the random nature of how uh, the sequence of play goes. So I'm going to need... Whew, this is going to take a lot of resources, but we're going to go ahead and give it a shot. The other two, they did not have any improvements on them. If they had an improvement also, they would have to stay in play available. And I forgot that at the beginning... I was supposed to have two 47 and 56 in play. So let's redo this. I'll say that those are the other two I drew. That is 47. Let me grab two and 56. There's two and 56. I will shuffle the target cards back up, put the two event card or two target cards that I drew already in the discard pile. First one we have is the minor airfield. It has an improvement, so it will stay in play anyway, but these always start the game in play. The minor airfield, it has the ability to be a secondary target. It is in the third band, right in the middle there of the Syrian map. You see it says one bandit. That means at the beginning of every turn, I'm gonna draw another bandit, which is a possible enemy aircraft fixed target, and we already seen the plus one center sight from the Intel, and this will give us a plus one center bandit, so that's even more aircraft to possibly deal with. We have the Scud launchers. They are a secondary target. They are dispersed. Dispersed targets means no matter how many hits you land with certain weapons, it only counts as one hit because they're spread out. There are weapons that I can place on my aircraft that ignore the dispersed condition because they have uh, like cluster bombs and things like that that can hit multiple targets. They're also a vehicle. A vehicle can take extra damage from certain weapons. And they also have the improvement of at the end of each day lose a victory point. Well, that is awful. Okay, so I need to reassess. Maybe I go after Central Command and the Scud launchers because losing a victory point at the end of every day is really going to hurt my evaluation at the end of my short campaign. I made the decision to shuffle those two targets I drew back in because these already started in play and I would definitely pick those. I looked in the rule book and it says when drawing target cards, you can draw up to the recon number. It says you may draw up to the number. I didn't see anywhere where it said you had to draw any. I don't think I have pilots that are trained enough or enough resources to go after Central Command and after the, one of those targets this time. So I'm going to go after Central Command and then in my next turn I'll go after those, which means I'm going to be down a victory point. I don't want to risk stressing out my pilots too much and failing at a, a target at the same time by trying to split my resources. So we're going to go with Central Command here. So we've drawn our target cards, we've selected a target, and now we're going to determine and place sites. 